This video follows the uncovering of a mystery. A search to discover the whys and wherefores of a rare machine known as the lightweight telewriter that was almost lost to history. Its reason for development, construction and operation is now complete, but the history of its design and manufacture remains fragmentary. The video has two purposes, to show the path by which the clues were gradually uncovered and to hope that it might reach someone who could add some further information. Any such information will be most gratefully received in the comments. The investigation has involved such diverse instruments as a bore scope, a multimeter, an oscilloscope and three Arduino microcontrollers. The World War II lightweight telewriter YB02251 is an extremely unconventional form of tape printer with a keyboard, a sort of mishmash of the German Hellschreiber, the electrochemical printing devices of the late 1800s and some inventions that are all its own. Although during the war years considerable effort was expended in the development of an apparatus known as the Telewriter and over a hundred machines were built, it had become virtually unknown and only a single machine ever reached the post-war surplus market. I bought my lightweight Telewriter along with some other equipment about 30 years ago but it lay forgotten in my attic until a totally unconnected event brought it to light. Soon after, for me, the lightweight Telewriter became an obsession, a sort of magical mystery tour, as clues came to light and gradually revealed its unusual construction and history. I say gradually, but in fact it was more like discrete steps, followed by dead ends. At times it seemed that I had exhausted all possible sources, when suddenly a new one emerged. The most important step was early in 2018 with the contacting of Frank Dornberg, who has a definitive website section on the German Hellschreiber and its variants. What followed between us was an intensive period of investigation and documentation, the result of which can be found on Frank's website. The URL for the Telewriter section is rather long, so follow these instructions. His website now explains the construction and operation of the machine in great detail and provides access to all of the relevant documents. The investigation intensity has gradually slowed, but even recently very significant extra information has suddenly appeared. But back to this video. I suppose the story starts in March 2018, when my wife and I decided to have our house re-roofed. As a first step, the old tiles and underlay were removed and a green roof underlay fitted. I decided to have a look in the attic to see that all was well. As soon as the trap door was opened, an unearthly green glow shone through. When I climbed up, the whole of the attic was illuminated as never before. Rummaging around, I came across a cloth bundle, which when unwrapped, revealed a device which I initially thought was some form of punch paper tape teleprinter with a keyboard. I dimly remembered buying it about 30 years before, along with some other things, but had put it in the attic for later investigation. Now its time had come. Initial inspection showed that it had a paper tape reel and transport mechanism, but where I expected to see a paper tape punch there was a print wheel with five small leaf springs fitted with points which swept across the tape in sequence as the mechanism was turned. The keyboard was equally unusual since instead of mechanical keys each letter was fitted with a coded crossbar which when pressed touched a set of 30 taut wires fitted below the keys. This underside view shows the key springs and beneath them the 30 taut wires. We will see this in more detail later. There was a complex drive mechanism which operated a multi-contact rotary switch, the paper tape transport and print wheel. The keys looked like 1930s typewriters keys. In operation, the tape spool is swung out to the right. There was a bulge in fuse holder, a post office type relay, 
and a round Bakelite device which turned out to be a buzzer. Under the fuse holder and terminal panel was a small motor with a centrifugal speed controller. Nothing about the device resembled a Creed teleprinter except the paper tape reel and speed regulator. At the top was an aluminium panel with operating instructions and a paper holder. When folded down this revealed a circuit diagram and the inscription Lightweight Telewriter. No maker's name or logo was present and the unit was mounted on a simple plywood board with wooden strips at the edges. How old was it? Was it a commercial device or military? Who designed it? Who made it? It was obvious that it had been designed for mass production. The Bakelite cover beneath the keys would have required expensive tooling to produce. An initial search of the internet with the word telewriter yielded lots of hits that mostly turned out to be antique devices for sending drawings down a telephone line or Dragon computer word processor software. Surprisingly, nothing seemed to be relevant. I was intrigued. Had I come across something rare? Quite how rare I was to discover. The fuse holder and fuse showed that it was English and I began to suspect that it might be a prototype of a World War II military device to be later fitted into some form of rugged case. During the 1950s and 1960s, loads of ex-military devices were released onto the surplus market and sold via adverts in electronics magazines such as Practical Wireless. I decided that this would be a good place to start my investigation. Luckily, I knew an American website, worldradiohistory.com, where you can do a word search of virtually every electronics magazine worldwide in articles or adverts. It's faster if you limit it to a particular country or countries. Doing a UK search for Telewriter yielded 51 hits, virtually all of them irrelevant, for example, the Dragon software. Limiting it to lightweight Telewriter yielded six hits, one of them directly relevant and extremely useful. It was a company advert, December 1961, in Shortwave magazine, selling a Telewriter, lightweight portable teleprinter, 12 volt DC, one only, 25 pounds. This seemed to be the machine in military garb. Greatly encouraged, I searched further and discovered two private adverts. The first was December 1962, looking for a telewriter motor and handbook, etc., and gave a name. Robertson, 9 Holbeck Lane, Chessant. He tried again in February 63 with a similar advert, but this time with a box number. It seemed likely that Mr. Robinson had bought the advertised telewriter, found that the motor was faulty, and was trying to get a replacement motor and data on the machine. I then tried Robertson as a search word, and as might be expected, I got a useless number of 4059 hits. I tried again with Robertson and Chessant. This gave success. Only 30 hits, and amongst them, B. Robertson, G3TTV, with the same address. It all fitted. He was a radio amateur. Further search revealed him to be secretary of the Chessant branch of the RSGB Radio Society of Great Britain. We returned to Mr. Robertson and his machine later, but before leaving the World Radio History site, I decided to see how many UK hits would turn up for well-known military radios. CR100 gave 2,268, AR88 gave 4,673. So the Telewriter was certainly rare. Now armed with the number YB02251, I started to do some more internet searching and was soon given the name of the Wireless Set 19 Group. This is a society with vast experience of military radios, transmitters, etc. I applied to join, explained that I had owned various devices such as a 19 set, a 38 set, and at present had an R1155 receiver a T1154 transmitter and a number of spy sets, but my current interest was this telewriter. 
I was accepted as a member and wrote a page describing the Telewriter in some detail. No one reported knowing this machine, but kindly provided me with several leads. Apparently the YB number was a Royal Ordnance Stores number, so the device must have gone through field tests and also might have an EMMA number. EMMAs stood for Electrical and Mechanical Engineering Regulations under a set of technical manuals covering all of the Army's technical equipment and were used by RIMI, the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, for the maintenance of the equipment. However, it was explained to me that there was no complete archive of these documents. Once the device was no longer in service, the Army got rid of the EMMA and documentation and even sometimes reissued the number to a new device. Prolonged searching using this new information unfortunately got me no results. So on a different tack I decided to contact every likely museum I could find to see if anything turned up. This moved things along since I got two replies from museums that had actually got a telewriter. The Signals Museum RAF Henlow contacted me through their curator Alf Fisher who turned out to be a 19 group member. Alf kindly sent me several photos of their machine and for the first time I was able to see the telewriter in its army issue form. The label on the case read YB02251 Telewriter GTL serial number 109, so at least 109 machines had been made. But what was GTL? A maker perhaps? Hundreds of hours of investigation have not yielded a definitive answer to this persistent mystery, so any suggestion would be gratefully received. Unfortunately this machine was missing several important parts, but at least the motor worked. All the main parts of my machine were present, but repackaged into a military form case made of resin bonded paper. The London Science Museum was also very helpful and put me in touch with one of their staff, Rachel Boone. She explained that they had a telewriter, serial number 28 in store, and she would get it out and have it photographed for me. The photos revealed that its arrangement was the same as the one in the Signals Museum RF Henlow, but this one appeared to be complete. In addition, this machine had a reel of pinkish coloured paper tape with the reference number YB03858, but the icing on the cake was a couple of 1968 letters offering to donate the machine. They were from B. Robertson and mentioned that the motor was missing. So it looks as if he was unable to trace a replacement motor or instructions, so realising the machine's rarity had donated to the Science Museum. He mentioned that it used electrolytic action and was similar in operation to the HAL system, which meant nothing to me at the time, but not compatible with it. Lots more internet searching began to suggest that Telewriter might have been designed by the Signals Research and Development Establishment, SRDE, based in Christchurch. Construction of parts of the machine could have been farmed out and the whole thing put together in-house. However, it would have been an expensive exercise and surely there should be a record somewhere. I then discovered that Major General RFH Nolder had written The History of British Army Signals in the Second World War, a General Survey, 1953, and also The Royal Corps of Signals, A History of Its Antecedents and Development, 1958. These books were out of print, but looked like promising sources, so I set about finding copies. Even on AB Books or eBay, these were expensive books, typically in the £50 to £150 region. But eventually I found a copy of the 1958 book for £30 and was able to borrow the other one from Bristol Library. These books paid off. They explained that from the early days of World War II, the general staff at the War Office constantly argued that some alternative to Morse should be found. There was no longer a large pool of Morse trained personnel available from the General Post Office, since for several years the GPO had moved over to teleprinters, and army training for Morse operation to a suitable level took significant time and absorbed skilled personnel. From the War Office down to Divisional Headquarters, Creed teleprinters solved the problem, but only to a certain extent. Initially there were significant problems with supply and because the GPO had to a large extent moved over to women uh, teleprinter operators 
which at this period did not suit army recruitment, training was still required. However, the main problem was for forward areas, where at the beginning of the war the choice was wireless, with its problems of security, or line equipment using telephony or morse via fuller phones. Explanations of the fuller phone can be found on the internet. What was required for forward areas was a less complicated, less expensive, DC-powered and lighter apparatus than the conventional teleprinter, which weighed at least 60 pounds. The apparatus should be suitable for line or wireless operation, hence the lightweight telewriter. But Nolder mentioned, during the war years, considerable effort was expended in the development of an apparatus known as the telewriter, but it did not prove satisfactory in the field. His other information enabled me to write a likely but uncertain telewriter procurement sequence, which can be found in the website below. However, it did not solve the problems of where the machine was designed, who built it, who did all the considerable effort, how many were built, or what GTL meant. I followed this up with buying lots of second-hand books on likely topics, but not a single mention of the telewriter was found, and no clue to GTL. A typical example was British Army Communications in the Second World War by Birmingham War Studies. Lots of information on wireless systems and their effectiveness in various campaigns, but nothing on the telewriter and virtually nothing on teleprinters either. Unpublished written sources also initially looked promising. One of these was the Gravely document. The Second World War, 1939 to 1945, Army Signal Communications War Office, 1950, written by T.B. Gravely and declassified in 1993. This was available in a 478-page download from the 19 group. However, although this was very interesting, it had nothing to say about the telewriter. I had hopes of the Goldstone document, written by F. Goldstone, who was employed in the workshops of SRDE from the very beginning of existence until 1945. However, this concentrates on the organisation of SRDE and says nothing about the actual equipment developed there. I therefore decided on a different approach. What was B. Robertson's reference to Hell about? I discovered that Hell stood for Hellschreiber, a device invented by Rudolf Hell. Dr. Rudolf Hell, 1901-2002 who developed the Hellschreiber tape printer system during the 1920s. It was a simple and robust system that produced readable communication even on low-quality wireless and landline telephone links. It was widely used by German news agencies in the 1930s and then by all the German armed forces from 1935 until the end of World War II. The Hellschreiber is a simple matrix system that fits between fax and teleprinters. Each character is printed in ink as a 7x5 dot matrix onto paper tape, column at a time, using a spiral spindle and a knife edge electromagnetically operated hammer. The first column is started at the bottom, and when the top dot position is reached, the printing starts in the bottom of the next column. The approach is continued until the last column is printed. How the apparatus achieves this is beyond the remit of this video, but is described in great detail in the website referred to below. The Telewriter also builds up characters as a dot matrix, column by column, but the technique to achieve this is totally different and can be seen in action later in this video. The system is not dead since its exceptional ability to use noisy transmission systems appeal to radio amateurs and has an enthusiastic following. As an experiment to see the robustness of Hellschreiber for myself, I loaded a Hellschreiber app onto an Android tablet and set it to acoustically record a message onto a handheld recorder. I then placed the recorder on the opposite side of the room and sent the message acoustically to the app on the tablet. There was no problem in reading the message. The secret is that the transmission noise simply results in a corrupted character which is still readable. Unlike a teleprinter, the technique never prints the wrong character. Following the Hellschreiber path, I soon came across the name of Frank Dorenberg. Frank had set out to discover every Hellschreiber machine that had ever existed and research and document them on his extensive website. 
I emailed him and together we set about unravelling the history, construction and function of the lightweight telewriter YB02251. This has taken a huge effort, the result of which can be found at Frank's website. However, it is still being added to as new discoveries come to light. Essentially, I examined my machine in great detail, transferred the data to Frank in photos, rough pencil drawings and notes, and then he, with his computer skills, entered them on his website as beautiful illustrations and polished text. For example, this photo shows some of the mechanism. I first sent Frank a photo and then a sketch identifying the main components. This had to be followed up with detailed sketches, of which this is an example. It was an iterative process involving the correction of misunderstandings and revision of details as the process proceeded and more details were understood. For some parts of the mechanism I had to use a bore scope to uncover the function. This was followed by an explanatory sketch, so that Frank could then produce his diagram. If what you're after is just the result of this endeavour, then go straight to Frank's website. The object of this video is not to reproduce Frank's website, but to explain the path by which the information was gradually revealed more in the style of an Agatha Christie mystery, so I hope you'll look at both. From now on, for simplicity, I will simply refer to Frank's website as the website. I was surprised to hear that Frank had previously come across a device that seemed to be a prototype of the Telewriter. In 2011, he had received a message from a David Jones, who recalled examining a rare Hellschreiber variant in late 1945 while he was working at the General Post Office research station, Dollis Hill. The machine was portable, British made, had a three row keyboard unlike the Telebriter, which has figure keys, and an electrochemical Hellschreiber printer system. He had written down his quite detailed memories, which matched my machine in uncanny detail. It was obviously a prototype of the Telewriter, but built in a non-production form. Unfortunately, this machine has disappeared. I'll now give a brief description of the various parts of the Telewriter. A much fuller description can be found on the website. The Telewriter keyboard is particularly interesting. Each key is fitted with its own crossbar and these crossbars slot into metal combs. This is similar to the wartime Creed 7B. Both machines use holes to lighten the bars, however here the similarity ends. The Creed uses a completely mechanical approach, whereas the Telewriter crossbars have coded projections on the bottom edge which complete electrical circuits. Each crossbar has a different set of projections which, when its key is pressed, touch certain of the 30 taut wires stretched beneath. The diagram shows the arrangement for the letter E. Each wire is connected to its particular stud on a rotary switch. Once a 12 volt supply is connected, the motor starts and depressing the key causes a sweep of the rotary contacts. A coded binary sequence therefore results at one of the machine terminals. In this way a 5x5 five five character can be produced, column by column. This shows an example of the letter E. The first five wires control the first column, the next five wires control the second column, and the further wires control the remaining columns. This will be demonstrated in a video clip later. The last five wires are not used, maybe certain other arrangements were considered but never implemented. When the last stud is reached, the motion stops. I discovered the basic sequence by circuit testing between each taut wire and the switch studs. The mechanism by which the operation is achieved is complex, but described in detail on the website. So the machine is a matrix device, similar to a Hellschreiber, in that it builds up each letter column by column. The next step was to examine the wiring of the other studs on the rotary switch. This was quite straightforward and we were able to produce a complete circuit diagram of this part of the machine. However, this did not reveal the script of the letters and numbers. It would have been possible to discover this one carat at a time by circuit testing, but I decided it would be more interesting to run the machine and feed the output to a storage oscilloscope. 
Unfortunately, the 12 volt motor didn't work. I removed the motor and dismantled it. I found that the commutator was in pieces and the coils damaged. I removed the broken pieces, greased the bearings and decided to attach a stepper motor in place of the centrifugal governor at the rear end of the motor using a flexible coupling. I then built and programmed three Arduino microcontroller units. A. A stepper motor drive unit. B. An opto-isolated output unit to feed a storage scope or other devices. C. A simulator of the telewriter output function to test unit B and ensure it was working correctly. For simplicity, I decide to restrict C to outputting a single test letter. The letter E seemed suitable and I later discovered that SRDE used the same letter in their testing. The stepper motor could not run as fast as the original motor, but the ability to run in slow motion or move through particular angles proved very useful for working out the function of some of the more intricate parts of the mechanism. This photo shows how the binary sequence was captured. The storage scope is the much derided eBay DSO138, but has proved invaluable. Initially there were contact problems, but after cleaning the studs it became quite reliable. Surprisingly, after at least 70 years, the wires and crossbars made good contact without cleaning. This may have been because I restricted the current to 10 milliamps, and as I discovered later, the taut wires were made from a special silver phosphor bronze material. I have been told that this material has a conductive oxide. From this, I started to write down the binary numbers and how they related to the characters. This interim drawing gives the idea, but includes some errors. Using this technique was OK, but I decided it would be even better to route the binary output to an LED array. This required some reprogramming. As a first step, I displayed the binary along the bottom of the array. However, my plan was to show the 5x5 characters as actual letters. It would have been possible to capture all the data for a letter and then display it in one go. However, I thought it would be much more interesting to build up the letters in the same way as the telewriter outputted them. Since we only needed to capture the script of these characters, it was not necessary to go to the complexity of a traversing display. This clip shows the system in action. and again at a faster speed but this composite shows the full character set there are a few errors caused by some of the crossbars having contacts that are slightly too wide or misaligned this could easily be corrected but I decided to leave the machine unmodified However, in true Hellschreiber fashion, the letters are still readable. This diagram shows the corrected character set. I'll move on now to the printer section of the machine. This diagram from Frank's website shows the path of the paper tape. Recent information explains that the special paper is impregnated with potassium iodide starch glycerine. On its way to the printing wheel, the tape is moistened with water by a wick fed from a bottle. The insulated print wheel has five equally spaced leaf springs, each fitted with a pointed tip. The leaf springs are connected to the 12 volt binary signal by a pair of slip rings. When a message is received, the print wheel rotates and the first spring point traverses the moistened paper strip. The coded 12 volt signal reaches the spring point and each character pulse causes an electrochemical reaction which results in a printed mark on the paper. In this way, the first column of the 5x5 matrix is recorded. The other four columns are printed as successive points traverse the strip. The process is described in great detail on the website, and information is given showing how the two machines are interconnected and call each other. However, back to the story of how more information about the telewriter was discovered. At one time, the BT archives and the National Archives seemed promising but their online search facilities yielded nothing useful and I have not been able to attend in person. 
an opportunity for someone else to contribute, perhaps? The YB numbers deserve more investigation. The best source for further study promised to be the training establishment RAOC Royal Army Corps F Branch Notes on Equipment, Volume 4, Signal and Wireless Stores. This is an extremely rare book, since most copies have been lost or destroyed. But Louis Merlstie, the author of the definitive Wireless for the Warrior books, was lent a complete copy, which he then printed as a restored facsimile edition shown here. It goes under the name Compendium 6. The original was dated February 1944, but Louis thinks that the closing date for the diagrams was nearer 1942. It's packed with interesting data and gives over 100 YB numbers, but does not have an entry for the Telewriter. To help in working out its position in a sequence, I produced a sequential index for the book. There were 17 devices mentioned after YB02251, but the numbers do not extend as far as the special paper YB03858. Unfortunately, recent information suggests that the sequence of numbers should not be taken too literally as a dating source. I decided it might be worth contacting Louis Mulsty to see if he'd come across the telewriter. He soon sent me a reply and said that many years before he'd been offered two telewriters, but as he now regrets, turned them down. He said that somewhere in his extensive archive he had a folder of information and thought he'd seen a photo of the telewriter connected to a wireless set number 11 for communication by wireless. He soon emailed me a copy of this pamphlet. Telewriter, Working Instructions, YB 04159, The War Office, Whitehall, December 1945. This is a 12-page document and contained Chapter 1, General Description, Chapter 2, Setting Up and Operating Instructions, Chapter 3, Operator's Maintenance. He also found the cover page of a draft Emma, but more of this later. It was a huge step forward, but not state a manufacturer or explain the meaning of GTL on the case. Scanning the internet for the umpteenth time, I came across 2019 downloadable surgical copies of the two-volume GPO Dollis Hill wartime diaries in original or transcribed form. Remembering the prototype that had been seen on a shelf at Dollis Hill in 1945, this looked interesting. There were several entries regarding electrochemical printers, plus a 16th of March 1944 section referring to specialised paper for the Army Lightweight Telewriter, which included a description of the electrochemical liquid used to impregnate the paper. I decided to intensify my search for GPO Dollis Hill references, and turned up a Manchester University PhD thesis awarded on the 31st of December 2020. It was called Research is the Door to Tomorrow, the Post Office Research Station at Dollis Hill, 1939 to 1965. It was completed by, of all people, Rachel Boone, who had provided the photos of the London Science Museum telewriter, a pleasing circularity. It did not mention the Telewriter, but gave lots of interesting background information of how GPO Dollis Hill and other English research establishments worked with manufacturers and were organised and related. However, the Telewriter designer, manufacturer and meaning of GTL were still unresolved. The internet is always expanding, so I decided to put GTL under scrutiny again. However, just as Telewriter was an unfortunate name and resulted in hundreds of fake leads to unrelated devices, GTL was just as bad. The vast majority of hits turned out to relate to gas to liquid technology, Global Telesystems Limited, an Indian telecom company, or other post World War II companies as checked out with their dates of foundation at Company's House. A not very convincing manufacturer possibility was the North London Company of Gestetner, a well-known manufacturer of copying machines. During World War I they had produced rifle grenades and the end caps of these were stamped GTL. I was able to establish that in World War II they were also involved in war work. 
they had all the right equipment and skills to produce a telewriter, and even made their own special paper. But so far, I've been unable to establish a positive link. Grace's Guide to British Industrial History, World War Military Glossaries, other guides, military biographies, indexes of all kinds, etc., etc., yielded nothing else relevant to GTL. Perhaps GTL was not a manufacturer, but some description, such as General Telecommunication Line. Leaving GTL, I thought it might be worth contacting Louis Milstey again, to see if he'd found anything else. To my delight, he came up trumps with SRD pamphlet number 568. This was a full copy of the first echelon work, Draft Emma Tells T223-1. stroke This was a very detailed 29-page document giving full instructions for the telewriter, setting up, routine technical maintenance, repair information, dismantling and assembly, plus diagrams with SRDE numbers. And it also referred to two other Emmas. Emma General Description tells T222-1 and Emma Adjustments tells A424-1. This is the bare bones of the story to date. Many paths of inquiry that led to nothing have been left out, but all of the relevant discoveries and references can be found on Frank Dorenberg's comprehensive website. I'm coming around to believe that the manufacture might have been carried out by SRDE, who I've learnt frequently oversaw projects from the design stage right through to issue. Parts could have been farmed out, others bought in or made in their own workshops. Both the army case and the prototype seen at Dollis Hill used resin bonded paper, a popular material in research establishment workshops. Commercial manufacturers were not keen to take on production of devices unless large numbers were involved. It would also explain why no manufacturer's name, logo or serial number are to be found on the actual machine. Surely a commercial company would have patented the keyboard system, but no patent was issued. After all, RFH Nolder of Signals seems to have known all about the telewriter. According to the SRD website, there was a special REMI unit at SRD Christchurch that produced the Emmas. The very detailed Emma for the telewriter would have required an intimate knowledge of the machine and had SRD diagram numbers. SRD was involved in field testing and had good connections to the research station at Dollis Hill. Of course, Dollis Hill themselves could have overseen the project, but surely it would have been mentioned in the war diary. But if so, what did GTL stand for? Suggestions gratefully received. The telewriters discovered to date are shown in this list.